the American Civil War did not erupt overnight. It was the result of decades of growing tension between the North and South. The North was rapidly industrializing with an economy based on manufacturing, trade, and free labor. Cities were growing, and immigrants were flooding into work in factories. The South, in contrast, remained largely agricultural, relying on slave labor to produce cotton and other cash crops. These economic differences led to diverging social structures and political priorities. The North valued education, innovation, and social mobility. The South prized tradition, hierarchy, and the plantation system. By the mid-19th century, the issue of slavery had become the focal point of this growing divide. This ideological chasm would prove impossible to bridge through peaceful means. The Missouri Compromise of 1820 was an early attempt to address the growing sectional divide over slavery. It arose from the question of whether Missouri should be admitted to the Union as a slave state or a free state. Henry Clay, known as the Great Compromiser, brokered a deal. Missouri would be admitted as a slave state, but Maine would also be admitted as a free state to maintain the balance. Additionally, slavery would be prohibited in the rest of the Louisiana Purchase Territory north of the 36 degree 30 parallel except for Missouri. This compromise temporarily eased tensions and preserved the Union. However, it did not address the fundamental moral and economic issues surrounding slavery. As the country continued to expand westward, the question of slavery in new territories would resurface with even greater intensity. The compromise would eventually be undermined by subsequent legislation and court decisions, setting the stage for further conflict. The Dred Scott v. Sanford case of 1857 was a pivotal moment in the lead-up to the Civil War. Dred Scott, a slave, had lived with his owner in free territories and sued for his freedom. The case eventually reached the Supreme Court. Chief Justice Roger B. Taney delivered a sweeping decision. The court ruled that African Americans, whether free or slave, were not and could never be citizens of the United States. It also declared that Congress had no power to prohibit slavery in the territories. This decision sent shockwaves through the nation, effectively invalidating the Missouri Compromise. For many in the North it seemed to confirm their fears of a slave power conspiracy. The Dred Scott decision intensified the sectional divide, emboldening southern slaveholders and infuriating northern abolitionists. The decision contributed significantly to the breakdown of trust between North and South, pushing the country closer to war. The Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, championed by Senator Stephen Douglas, was another critical event in the lead-up to the Civil War. This act created the territories of Kansas and Nebraska and allowed them to decide the issue of slavery through popular sovereignty. This effectively repealed the Missouri Compromise. Both pro-slavery and anti-slavery settlers rushed to Kansas, each side determined to win control of the territory. This led to a period of violent conflict known as Bleeding Kansas. In Kansas, rival territorial governments were established and armed confrontations became common. The violence reached a peak in 1856 with events like the sacking of Lawrence by pro-slavery forces and John Brown's retaliatory Pottawatomie Massacre. These bloody incidents shocked the nation and further polarized public opinion. The Kansas-Nebraska Act and its aftermath had far-reaching consequences, destroying the Whig Party and giving rise to the Republican Party. The violence in Kansas was a grim foreshadowing of the larger conflict to come. John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry in 1859 was a dramatic event that pushed the nation closer to civil war. Brown, a radical abolitionist, led a small group of men in an attack on the Federal Armory at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. His goal was to seize weapons and incite a slave rebellion. The raid itself was a failure. Brown and his men were quickly captured. However, the impact of Brown's actions far outweighed their immediate results. The raid sent shockwaves through both North and South. In the North, reactions were mixed. Some viewed Brown as a martyr, while others condemned his violent methods. In the South, the reaction was one of near universal horror and outrage. Southerners saw the raid as proof that Northern abolitionists were willing to resort to violence to destroy their way of life. John Brown's raid thus served as a catalyst, accelerating the move towards secession and war. The election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860 triggered Southern secession and the Civil War. Lincoln rose to prominence in the 1850s with the Republican Party. He gained attention through debates with Stephen Douglas in 1858. Lincoln opposed slavery but initially wanted to stop its spread. His position was too radical for the South. 
1860 election saw the Democratic Party split. This allowed Lincoln to win with 40% of the vote. The South saw Lincoln's election as a threat. The election of Abraham Lincoln in November 1860 set off a chain reaction of secession in the South. South Carolina took the lead. On December 20, 1860, a special convention voted to secede. Other Deep South states quickly followed. By February 1861, seven states had seceded. They formed the Confederate States of America with Jefferson Davis as president. Seceding states seized federal forts and properties. The economic differences between North and South were a major factor in the growing sectional divide. By 1860, the North had become an industrial powerhouse with a diverse economy based on manufacturing, commerce, finance, and transportation. The North had an extensive railroad network, thriving cities, and a large working class. The South, in contrast, remained primarily agricultural, dominated by the production of cotton and other cash crops for export. This system depended heavily on slave labor. The South lacked significant railroad infrastructure and had few large cities. These economic differences led to conflicting political priorities. The North favored high tariffs to protect its industries, while the South preferred free trade and lower tariffs. The economic disparity between North and South grew wider over time, fueling Southern fears of being economically and politically marginalized within the Union. These economic tensions contributed significantly to the sectional animosity that led to war. The abolition movement played a crucial role in heightening tensions between North and South. While abolitionists were a minority even in the North, their influence grew steadily throughout the antebellum period. Figures like William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, and Harriet Beecher Stowe brought the moral evil of slavery to public attention. Garrison's newspaper, The Liberator, published scathing critiques of slavery. Douglas, a former slave, gave powerful speeches about the realities of slave life. Stowe's novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, humanized slaves for many Northern readers and inflamed anti-slavery sentiment. The South reacted to the abolition movement with alarm and anger. Slaveholders saw abolitionists as a direct threat to their way of life and economic survival. The abolition movement forced the issue of slavery to the forefront of national politics, making compromise increasingly difficult. The movement's growing influence in the North deepened Southern fears of being outnumbered and overpowered in the national government. The North and South had developed distinct cultural identities by the mid-19th century. The North was more urban, diverse, and rapidly changing, valuing innovation, education, and social mobility. The South was more rural, homogeneous, and traditional, prizing hierarchy, honor, and a romanticized vision of plantation life. Religion played a significant role in shaping these cultural differences. Northern churches often embraced social reform movements like abolition and temperance. Southern churches tended to be more conservative and used biblical arguments to defend slavery. The North generally favored a stronger federal government, while the South preferred a weaker federal government and stronger state governments. These cultural differences made it increasingly difficult for Northerners and Southerners to understand or empathize with each other. They began to see themselves as distinct peoples with incompatible values and interests. This cultural divide deepened the political and economic tensions between the regions, making conflict seem increasingly inevitable. In the months following Lincoln's election and the initial wave of secession, tensions continued to escalate. The remaining southern states were caught in a difficult position. They were reluctant to leave the Union, but also hesitant to side with the North against their southern neighbors. The focus of the nation turned to the federal forts in the South, particularly Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. The fort was running low on supplies, and Lincoln faced a dilemma. Abandoning the fort would be seen as recognizing the Confederacy, but resupplying it might be seen as an act of aggression by the South. Lincoln decided to send supplies to Fort Sumter, informing the South Carolina government of his intentions. The Confederate government led by Jefferson Davis decided to act first. On April 12, 1861, Confederate forces began bombarding Fort Sumter. The attack on Fort Sumter galvanized the North, and the American Civil War had begun. Please like and subscribe to the channel.